and welcome to Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. I'm Ahu K. Kahu Cardwell with the Kiwani Foundation, and look where we are today on the beautiful windward side of Oahu. Rick. Hey. Aloha. Aloha. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Rick Barboza. Did I yep. say your name right? Yep. Rick, yep. tell us where we are. This is beautiful. Oh, mahalo. Uh, this is Huiku Maliola, and it is uh, a native plant nursery and landscaping company and habitat restoration, and we do all kind of stuff. But Huiku Maliola. Maliola. And what does that mean in English? Uh, it means the organization that stands for native life. Wow. Uh, so we, we primarily deal with native plants, uh, but we really are in the business of of trying to bring everything that's unique to Hawaii back to life together again and usually the plants is the main focus of all of that because so, everything re, re, you know kind of revolves around it or depends on the plants. Rick when you say native plants you mean plants that are indigenous to Hawaii? Yes. Indigenous and endemic. Yes. What is the difference between those two? Well they're both considered native but indigenous means that it's native to Hawaii but also native to other parts of the world. Uh, Endemic means that it's only found in Hawaii and nowhere else in the world. And in Hawaii, of all of our native plants, 90% uh, are endemic. Really? Yeah. That's unusual, yeah. huh? Yeah, we have a really high rate of endemism here in Hawaii, just primarily due to our isolation. Yeah, yeah. wow. Yep. So you guys started this this uh, business here to yep. re... I well, was to say refurbish, but reforest <coughs> Hawaii with its endemic and native plants yes yes yeah we started it me and my business partner um, Matt Kapaliku Sherman we both from Waimanalo and uh, we both were at UH we've been friends forever but uh, while University we were at Hawaii, UH yes. yeah University of Hawaii while we were there uh, he was um, a Hawaiian studies major and I was a zoology major but my focus was conservation biology and, um, and we we both you know understood the need for native plants in our prospective you know um, schools and uh, his one, you know, in Hawaiian studies, you know, you learn about all of these uh, chants and oli and place names, and a lot of times there's references to native plants. But then when you try and uh, see those native plants, you know, it's hard to it's you hard can't to find. find them. Yeah, you can't find them. Yeah. And then, Where and then did they same, go? Yeah, same thing for me. It's like from our end, you know, you learn about all this Hawaii being the extinction capital of the world and the endangered species capital of the world, and it's like that made me realize it's like okay well what about all these plants in our yards and everything and then you find out that those plants are all introduced into Hawaii and everything that we pretty much surround ourselves today with are introduced plants and so it got me wanting to learn more about what plants were here before anybody else and what plants our ancestors used and what plants you know what that uh, were our native birds relied upon and and and, uh, and so both he and I, and, and thankfully, um, his dad had a nice piece of property in Waimanalo is where we, where we started our operation. And we were there for several years, and then we moved here in about 2005. And um, yeah, we've been here ever since. So, uh, so Huiku Maoli Ola has yes. been in business for how long now? About November will make 16 years. 16 years, yeah. wow. But we've, uh, we started growing plants we started the operation back when we were in college and then when we graduated like right before we graduated we actually registered the business and everything and became legit but it was went from a hobby to a to a business and um, after we graduated we gave ourselves a year to see where we could go with with the company and if it did well we would stick to it if it didn't then we would go back to school this is where all of our workers do most of their work and then you know they do cuttings they pot up plants uh, and whatnot and then when they're planting seeds or they're making cuttings, usually everything goes into this house, which is our mist house. Okay, so they go through <coughs> cuttings in, in pots right into here. Right into here. And this is stage this one. Is, this is stage one. So gotcha. this is where most of our plants and cuttings get the rooted. The ones. Yeah. So we either plant, <coughs> the, the mist is going to go off in here. It goes off for about five seconds every five minutes. So, so you're telling me I so should yeah, back So up. here it goes. It's just here we go. Oh, look right at this. Now. Look at this. Uh, here we go. Yeah. And so what that does is it kind of keeps the area, uh, the plants and the cuttings moist without oversaturating saturating them so that they become yeah. rotted. And, uh, and depending on the species, you know, a, uh, a cutting or a propagule will stay in here from two weeks, anywhere up to six months. This is pretty much stage two where we have a lot of our small cakey baby plants uh, that come out of the mist house. 
and then they, they grew up here a little bit bigger and then once they fill out those four inch pots then usually they'll get potted up into larger gallon pots. We have about 160 different species of plants here and it, you know I should say also in addition to our native plants we also grow a lot of Polynesian introduced plants so the plants that or canoe plants so the plants that the Polynesians brought with them when they settled in Hawaii. So things like taro, kalo, uala, sweet potato, uh, sugarcane, ulu, um, all of these plants that were essential to the establishment of the Hawaiian culture, uh, we also propagate here. So anything that is very uh, in need that, that, that helped Hawaiians become Hawaiian, uh, you know, different from Tahitian or Marquesan or wherever they came from mm -hmm. uh, and made them uniquely Hawaiian, we have the plants that are uniquely Hawaiian as well. Rick, when the Westerners, the Europeans arrived in Hawaii, yep. did they, over the years, bring a lot of plants with them? They brought a lot. A, a lot. lot of, I mean, and not just, you know, Europeans, but all the settlers that came into Hawaii. So whether they're from Japan or the Philippines or China or, you know, Vietnam. Um, to put into perspective, we have approximately 1,500 native plant species. So plants that are native to Hawaii, we have about 1,500 different species. Uh, within the last 200 years, we have over 8,000 species wow. that have become naturalized in Hawaii. From an ecological standpoint, that's disastrous. And yes. that is one of the reasons why we're the extinction and endangered species capital of the world is because, you know, we're looking at a natural rate of introduction, you know, without the help of man, you know, averaging about once every 10,000 years. A lot of shifts in... in in how um, the landscape has been, and, and it's drastically changed. And, and one of the another reason why Hawaii is the extinction capital of the world is when you think about biodiversity. You know, a lot of times you think of places like uh, the Amazon, right? The Amazon has a ton of different species living within it. And that's a rainforest. And most times when people think about biodiversity, they automatically think of the rainforest. Well, in Hawaii we were different. Uh, most of our biodiversity took place in the lowland dry forests. And in our rainforest, we do have rainforests, but our rainforests are dominated by koa trees, hapu'u tree ferns, you know, and ohia trees maybe, you know. Uh, but in our lowland dry forests is where we had most of our species composition. And today, that's where we all live, right? If you think about it. Look the at lowland. The, the lowlands. That's All where the, the flat areas. Are built. That's where the houses are built. That's where the freeways are. And in order to build all those houses and build all those freeways, we got to dig out the plants. But prior, even prior to the houses being built, um, those areas were prime monoculture agriculture, you know, like yes. pineapples and sugarcane. Yeah. So to me, that was probably one of the biggest uh, threats to, to Hawaii's um, native species was the transition from a lo'i system, you know, and self-sustenance to now we're exporting agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, like pineapples and, and sugarcane. And back then, you know, there, were, there weren't nearly the type of restrictions as there are in place now because nothing was endangered back then, you know? And now everything is. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big problem. And we have, we have very few plants today. We have over 110 species of plants of the 1,500 that are now considered extinct. Mm. So yeah, almost 10% of our native plants are now considered extinct. In addition to a lot of the plants that we grow primarily for landscaping or habitat restoration or you know, um, just for people to enjoy in their yards, we have a lot of plants that, are, that serve a function traditionally. So for example, we grow a lot of plants that are medicinal and, uh, and a lot of times, Plants that people have in their yards are medicinal, they don't even know about it. Um, but we, we grow uh, stuff like popolo plants that were highly valued for their medicinal properties. And what even, do they do, Rick? Uh, well, the, the, the berries are edible, but the leaves are actually themselves are, are very medicinal in, in use as well. This is a native red hibiscus. Oh, look at that. How yeah, beautiful. most of the times when you see wow. hibiscus in people's yards, mm -hmm. uh, at least before, you know, those big. Well, it looks far different ones. than this. Yeah, it looks a lot different. A so the, more ones, delicate. the ones that we think of hibiscus are actually imported. They're most likely hybrids. I see, yeah. but this is what we're looking at is the original. That's a native one, yeah. This is Ma'ohauhele, which is uh, our state flower or the plant that produces our state flower. Look at and that. Like I said, it's a hibiscus, which it doesn't 
typically look like your common hibiscus because of its leaves. Uh, but yeah, like I said, it's also an endangered species. Both of these plants are what we consider Polynesian introduced. So this is an ape uh, related to taro uh -huh. and it was used as a famine food. And then this right here is a unique variegated avapuhi or shampoo ginger. Wow. So, yeah. And that you can actually make shampoo from it, get shampoo yeah. from it to yeah, shampoo Yeah, you squeeze your the flower yeah. and all of this liquid comes out. That's the consistency and texture of shampoo and you use it to bathe yourself and it has a really nice ginger fragrance. Wow. Yeah. And then you can also drink it too. I see some completely different plants over here. Yeah. Yeah. So actually this table is kind of unique for, this is, uh, this is kind of my, I don't want to say special table, but we basically built that entire greenhouse right there, which is, has nothing in it yet. We just finished building it to house mostly most of these plants. So this is kind of the area where the plants are either extremely rare or they're, we're introducing them into the market. Is that right? Yeah. So we're these are very special plants, right? These right are there. very special plants. Yes. What's the most rare one you have here, Rick? Gosh, we actually have plants that are listed as extinct in the wild. But um, they're here on this table. They're here on this table. Oh my yeah. goodness. Show yeah. me one of those, would you? Um, this one is actually kind of unique. This one right here um, is a native gardenia. Really? So we actually have three gardenias that are native to Hawaii that most people in Hawaii don't even know about. And if you're growing gardenia in Hawaii, you're either growing some hybrid or a tiare. You know, and a tiare is a Tahitian gardenia. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have Hawaiian gardenias. And, um, but what makes this one unique is that um, <clears throat> on Oahu, we have two different species of native gardenias. One is Gardenia manii, which is only found in the Ko'ola Mountains, I believe. And the second is Gardenia brigamii. They're both called Na'u or Nanu. Um, and when I first started growing native plants, uh, there were three plants left in the wild of Gardenia brigamii. Uh, two were in Nanakuli Valley. One was in Honu'uli'uli. And, um, one of the plants in Nanakuli Valley died in a brush fire. So now there's only one plant left in Nanakuli. And then the one that was in Honu'uli Uli actually died of old age. Like it was being monitored for a really long time and, and um, for whatever reason it died. So now you're down to one yeah. So now plant? we're down to one plant left in the wild. Wow. Um, but what's interesting about this one is that this plant um, came from an old time botanist, his name is John Obata, and there's actually some native plants that have their scientific name named after him. Really knowledgeable guy. Um, and uh, his yard, you know, he's, been, he's been botanizing Hawaii forever. And uh, his yard in Wanalua Valley had some <coughs> amazing native plants in it. And he pulls me up to this gardenia and he's like, hey, this, this is the gardenia that's from Pu'uku'ua. Um, you know, he took a, a seedling or a seed off of it, uh, grew it out in his yard, and Pu'uku'u is the one that's in Honu'uli'uli. Uli. And um, he let me take cuttings off of it. And so I took cuttings off of it, uh, and then that plant died. So oh. technically, this is the, you know, the one... This living, is it. This, this is the this living is it right example. Here. Of, wow. Yeah, and then, you know, he wow. might still have the one in his yard, but then recently, due to his, you know, he's getting really old, uh, he moved to San Diego to be with the rest of his family and he had to sell his house so and which is why he wanted me to come over and take cuttings of all the plants at his house because he wasn't sure what was going to happen with those plants once they sold the house. So here it is right here. So that's the Pu'uku'ua wow. genealogy descendant of a plant that's now no longer available. Wow. Yeah, no longer around. This plant right here is, is a, a wetland plant which is uncommon on Oahu but it's found on Oahu too. Uh, it's called Makaloa. And if you ever read Robert Louis Stevenson books, you know, he's, he was a, <clears throat> wrote a lot of short stories uh, about Hawaii and the Pacific. So he's traveled all throughout the Pacific. He said that of all the places in the Pacific, there were no mats finer than the Makaloa mats of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And that's the plant that was woven to make those mats. Interesting, Rick, because as I look at this plant here... It's small. It's small, but it doesn't look like anything that would be in a tropical place like Hawaii. It yeah. looks more like reeds that would grow yeah. in some stream maybe in California or <laughs> no, this is Oregon Hawaiian or something plant. like that. Wow. We actually have a lot of wetlands in Hawaii, except a lot of them have been filled in or they're now dominated by invasive species. For Inside of here is a little bit, it's our shade house. So every 
greenhouse that we've been in before has actually a clear roof. This one has a shade roof on it. And uh, we're trying to bring back different species of, of ferns um, and, and plants that are a little bit more shade tolerant. Um, this one is a kind of unique plant. Um, it's called kupu kupu. There's a lot of nurseries that grow kupu kupu, uh, but nobody really knows the affinity of those kupu kupu. Um, and, and in fact, we were even growing them for a long time because it was the same species and it was called kupu kupu. Uh, these ones, however, I was, I was uh, part of an expedition that went to go up and collect lolu seeds. Um, and during that time, and lolu is one of our native fan palms, or our only native fan palm, I should say. Um, <clears throat> and during that, we're coming down this ridge <laughs> trying to get to this pocket of lolu. And um, when we were going down there, we were slipping and sliding and trying to prevent ourselves from falling off the mountain. And in doing that, we had pulled out a handful of these ferns accidentally because the entire slope was this fern. And um, so between the, the organizations that were there, um, I think there were like 14 little baby ferns that got ripped out. So I took seven of them <laughs> and um, Lion Arboretum took the other half. So they got divvied up. We got divvied up, yeah. Okay. And uh, from the seven that we had, I just kept on propagating them and propagating them and propagating them. And now we have and this, is this it. whole table, wow. this half a table, all of those on there. I just kept on propagating them. And now I know exactly where these plants came from. And we took seven plants and made over 5,000. As much as I was shocked about realizing and bummed out, really, realizing about everything that wasn't Hawaiian and what terrible state our natural resources are in, it made me want to learn more and more and more and more. And so, um, you know, it started off with just these native plants. Actually, it started off back when, when I was in high school. I was into marine biology. And when I went to UH, I went into UH to become a marine biologist. And then um, it kind of evolved to, to this because I was just blown away thinking that, you know, I thought our ocean resources were bad. Um, which, you know, they're not, <laughs> they're not great, mm -hmm. but our land resources are in way worse shape. Mm -hmm. uh, everything from our water, you know, in our streams to our native plants and our, especially our native birds. And so one of the main drivers for doing this was to try and provide habitat more for our, our native forest birds and then our native snails. You know, we have some beautiful land snails in Hawaii, yes. except they're probably the rarest snails in the world. Yes. <laughs> You know, what's amazing to me, Rick, is that not only did you learn all this stuff, mm -hmm. but that this information actually survived. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah. plant goes, it could be forgotten. Yeah, totally. And, and, you know, if it weren't for the guys that, you know, did the trailblazing to document all of these plants, you know, all the botanists that, that, that came down to study in Hawaii and document everything, yeah, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have nearly half of the information that we do today. Wow. Um, How much has been captured and remembered versus forgotten uh, you know that's hard to say um, for example one of the plants in our greenhouses that we have uh, today we call it Carex wahuensis which is its botanical name mm -hmm. Carex is the genus wahuensis is the species name and it's an endemic species it's in nowhere you know a, as rare as some other plants uh, but to this date there is no known Hawaiian name for it yeah. really why is yeah. that it's just it's lost wow yeah. So nobody knows the Hawaiian name for that. There's a, but then on the other flip side, there's some trees and such that are extremely rare that nobody really knows the, the Hawaiian name for it. And there's still plants being discovered today that nobody's ever documented before that we don't know what the Hawaiian name is. Wow. So, so in that case, I mean, you know, it's, it's, to me, losing the name is one thing, but losing the plant altogether is, is, is worse, you yeah. know, and, and we can always do our parts as Hawaiians to, to uh, you know, possibly give it a name that would be most fitting for the plant, you know, and 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 um, in some cases that's already being done. Like for example, the on Maui we have a rare Maui parrot bill, which is a bird. Um, there was no known Hawaiian name for the parrot bill, so one was recently given to it, and um, the name that was given to it is uh, was that an onomatopoeia, which is where the the sound that it makes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the Hawaiian name for it, I believe, is. Um, Kiwi Kiwi Q, Kiwi Q, and that's the sound that the, the wow. bird makes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. 
before Western contact, before even Polynesian contact, before yeah. the Tahitians and everybody else came yeah. here. Oh, hey, it was when it was awesome. just Oh, but it must have looked completely totally different, different. Yeah. completely different. Yeah, like nothing like what it looks yeah. like today. Huh? Yeah, and and that, and that's like when people daydream. I do that a lot. Like whenever I'm in areas that, you know, I, especially in areas that I've never been to before, and I see what's there, and then I try and envision what was there before. Mm -hmm. I, I waste so much time doing it, but it's not necessarily a waste of time because I enjoy doing it, and then it helps with, you know, trying to. It's, it's like a CSI thing. You know, you're trying to solve the puzzle of what was here before yeah and you can kind of get an idea of what the plant community was like based off of other areas that have a similar environment and you can kind of piecemeal the, the plants that are still there maybe in those areas too so so I, I, I do I waste a lot of time doing that Wow so it sounds <laughs> like there was maybe three or four different completely different Hawaii's in terms of what it, the, yeah, there was like. the, the pre-Hawaiian, Yep. then there was the Polynesian, pre-Polynesian, then there was the Polynesian, then there was the European, post-European. Right. Yeah. And each one of those were not even similar or close to Yeah, similar. and now we're transitioning into a new one, right? So, yeah. so you know, even, even the Polynesians, when they settled here, there's um, there was extinction that took place. Sure. Um, primarily in, in possibly our um, bird species. Uh, are flightless birds. We had a lot of flightless birds uh, here in Hawaii. Um, but then there was an, a landscape alteration then. Then when the Europeans came in and, and commercialized a lot of our land and, um, and that, like I said, the, the mono agriculture came in, uh, that definitely did a number on us. Um, and then now we're realizing the state, right? So now there's this transition. And you know, our company uh, tagline is Hui Kumaliola transforming land back to Aina. Yes. And so, so what we're trying to do is we're taking land and trying to transform it back to how it was, uh, or how we can best perceive it to, to have been. Yeah. yeah. Rick, I know you have an area up here that we're not going to be going to today, but you said some school kids are going up there to look and yep. to learn for themselves. Yep. What happens when you bring people in here, whether they're this tall or this tall, and they begin to see this and they begin to hear this information. What effect yeah. does that have upon them? Um, a lot, well, it's a lot of learning. No matter what age you are, you're going to learn. And, and when you're younger, we just try, actually, it doesn't matter what age you are, we always try to just make it fun. Because the best way to learn is, is, is and to retain that knowledge uh, or a new knowledge is to make it either applicable to something or just make it fun to learn. And, uh, and so students really like coming here because you know, we have, a, uh, and actually what we're, the area that we're primarily talking about is our nonprofit called Papahana Kuola. Mm -hmm. And uh, Papahana Kuola is an unbelievable, great organization. We have a bunch of directors that, that are running it that, that do tremendous work, uh, both on site and away from, from the facility too. We have actually teachers that go into the schools and, and give lectures. Right, but aren't um, people really amazed and shocked when they begin to learn they, this stuff? Yeah, they, a lot of times, I mean, especially the residents, the people that have lived there their whole lives. And, and they thought Hawaii just looked like one back. thing and then yeah, they realized they're just taken back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and then, and then and when we have visitors that come in here and, and we tell them that, you know, you're basically surrounded by plants and actually out there is a good place to look because this is the type of plants that surround most places in Hawaii. This is what and people think of, Hawaii looks yeah, like. Yeah, and the they think Hawaii. that that's Hawaiian. Yeah. But none yeah. of those plants in that area are Hawaiian, except for yeah. maybe a couple of kukui nut trees I can yeah. see. So, yeah. yeah. So and things that we often, often associate with Hawaii, you know, like uh, mangoes, papayas, pineapples. All those this are stuff all from introduced. Here all the way. Uh, well, kukui is Hawaiian. All right, but it's a Polynesian introduced but plant. This stuff over but here, this is, in that area, that's all jungle that we're trying to reclaim and transform right. back to native plants. But that's like postcard Hawaii. That's what people think of yep. as Hawaii. Mangoes and pineapples. Yeah. Yeah. Hawaiian host chocolate, macadamia nuts. <laughs> not Hawaiian. But that's not Hawaii. No. That's totally not Hawaii. And in wow. fact, that like tears a gut in me looking at it because of all of the plants in there that are really just invasive species. But wow. yet we've come to We've acclimated ourselves into believing that that's Hawaii, you know, until you really sit down and you learn about it and you're like, oh man, and then what are you going to do about it? But if there's a conscious effort made to restore Hawaii back to how it was, you know, how about just giving ourselves the time frame of, of how long it took for it to get bad?
you know. So, you know, things have gotten really bad in the last 200 something years. Let's, and that's without even really trying, you know. I mean, they just did stuff and inadvertently it made everything messed up. If we can actually try to reverse the process and make it better, I think we could make a huge impact in the next 200 years. What's at stake if we don't? Uh, everything that we consider Hawaii. We're going to have to change our name. We're going to have to change the Hawaiian Islands to something else because that's not Hawaii. Mm -hmm. and, and we're on track to, to yeah, making Hawaii not Hawaii anymore. So we're transforming land back to Aina. So, Transforming yeah. Hawaii back to Hawaii. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Rick, thank you so much. That's where no we're going to have to leave it. Thank you. Thank you for showing us around Mahalo. your place here. It's, it's just awesome. Please <laughs> keep doing what you're doing because Mahalo, yeah. we want to see Hawaii return to Hawaii. Yeah, we do. Wow. We do. I really don't know how to do anything else, so this is, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Wonderful. And to our viewers, mahalo to you for joining us with Rick Barboza here today. This is an amazing operation he has. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24-7 on VoicesOfTruthTV.com, and you can like Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's Future on Facebook. I'm Ehu K. Kahu Cardwell with the Kiwani Foundation. And until next time, ahui ho! Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends. Also view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.